नम ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा पूजले श्रीमते पाक्षे वेदंता स्वामी ने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादे पश्चाधारिणे श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गधाधा श्री वसती गौरा भक्त रिंद जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गधाधा श्री वसति गौरा भक्त रिंद जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गधाधा श्री वसति गौरा भक्त रिंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय गौरनिधाय 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 जय गौरनिधाय 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 जय गौरनिधाय निताय जी सुंदर निताय जी सुंदर निताय जी सुंदर जय निताय जी सुंदर निताय जी सुंदर निताय जी सुंदर निताय जी सुंदर जय निताय जी सुंदर जय गिरी गोबान गिरी गोबान गिरी गोबान जय गिरी गोबान गिरी गोबान गिरी गोबान जय गिरी गोबान जय गिरी गोबान प्रभु पाद जय प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय जय प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय प्रभु पाद जय श्री श्री निताय जय श्री सुंदर श्री की जय गिर राज गोविंदन की जय गौर प्रेम नंदी हरि बोल हरे कृष्ण वेलकम 
Vijay, welcome. Prakash, Amit, don't know where he is, so what? I hope you had a good week. Krishna conscious week. Let's change our microphone settings. Okay. So, what shall we discuss tonight? Vijay, Prakash, come up with a verse. <coughs> topic if you like we will, I can put a topic in and then we will also look so many verses will come up what would you like to discuss Vijay I was listening to one of the um, Prabhupada's talks huh? and, um, on YouTube he mentioned um, the reference chapter sorry um, Four nine. Chapter nine. Yeah, sorry, chapter uh, four, um, verse nine. Four nine. Yeah, four nine. Yeah, yeah. Four point nine. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Let's look what four point nine is. Sir. Bhagavad Gita four point nine. Very famous verse. Yep, nice. Important verse. Let me share that screen also with you. Screen share. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya We are discussing Transcendental Knowledge, Chapter 4, Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 4, Text 9. And welcome all those on YouTube, thousands of followers, and Vijay and Prakash, if you have not followed us on YouTube, please do so. YouTube followers. We want to increase the number of followers and the content and everything. So please do follow us. If you don't know how to find us on YouTube, look back at some postings or just type in and search for Goranga Sundara Das. That will do. So, here we're discussing text 9. Janma karma cha metivyam evam yo veti tatvataha jaktvati hampuna janma naitimam edisarchuna. Which are you want to read the translation? It's okay. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. The Lord's descent from His transcendental abode is already explained in the sixth verse. One who can understand the truth of the appearance of the personality of Godhead is already liberated. A material bondage and therefore he returns to the kingdom of God immediately after quitting his present material body such a liberation of the living entity from material bondage 
it's not at all easy. The impersonalists and the yogis attain liberation only after much trouble and many, many births. Even then, the liberation they achieve, merging into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti of the Lord, is only partial, and there is the risk of returning to this material world. But the devotee, simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and the activities of the Lord, attains the abode of the Lord after ending his body and does not run the risk of returning to this material world. In the Brahma Samhita 533, it is stated that the Lord has many, many forms and incarnations. Advaitam, Achuntiyam, Ananadim, Ananta Rupam. Although there are many transcendental forms of the Lord, they are still one and the same Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, one has to understand this fact with conviction, although it is incomprehensible to the mundane scholars in empiric philosophers, as stated in the Vedas, uh, Pursa Bodhini Upanishad. Eko Devo Nitya Lila Nur Rakatu Bhakta Dayapi Kitre Anta Atma. The one Supreme Personality of Godhead is eternally engaged in many, many transcendental forms in relationship with his unalloyed devotees. This Vedic version is confirmed in this verse of the Gita, personally by the Lord. He who accepts this truth on the strength of the authority of the Vedas and of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, um, and who does not waste time in philosophical speculations, attains the highest perfection of liberation. Simply by accepting this truth on faith, one can without doubt attain liberation. The Vedic version, Tatvam Asi, is actually applied in this case. Anyone who understands Lord Krishna to be the Supreme, or who says unto the Lord, you are the same Supreme Brahman, the personality of Godhead is certainly liberated instantly, and consequently his entrance into the transcendental association of the Lord is guaranteed. In other words, such a faithful devotee of the Lord attains perfection, and this is confirmed in the following Vedic assertion. Tam iva vidhikriyati mitriyam iti Nanyaha Panta Vidyati Yanaya. One can attain the perfect stage of liberation from birth and death simply by knowing the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and there is no other way to achieve this perfection. So that the Swetta Swaha Tanha Upanishad 3.8. There is no alternative means for anyone who does not understand the Lord Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead is surely in the mode of ignorance and consequently he will not attain salvation simply, so to speak, by licking the outer surface of the bottle of honey or by interpreting the Bhagavad Gita according to mundane scholarship. Such empiric Philosophers may assume very important roles in the material world, but they are not necessarily eligible for liberation. Such puffed up mundane scholars have to wait for the causeless mercy of the Lord, sorry, uh, causeless mercy of the devotee of the Lord. One should therefore cultivate Krishna consciousness with faith and knowledge, and in this way attain perfection, surrender unto me. Hey Krishna, thank you, Dom. 
Vijay. Let's read the translation again. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. <coughs> now, this is a very nice verse, of course. So, oh, it sounds so easy. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities. Oh, I know. Krishna is appearing in the prison house of Kamsa. And he appears first in his Vishnu, four-handed form with disc, club, lotus and chakra. And it is a transcendental nature with beyond appears like an appears like Krishna has taken on a, a human like form. We never say human form because it's not a human form. Human form doesn't appear four handed. A Vishnu form with bluish color and helmet and garlands and armlets and earrings and everything, fully decorated. No child appears like that. So therefore it's a, it's a transcendental nature. Uh, transcendental nature means, of course, beyond. It is material nature. There is another nature, spiritual nature. We could also say one who knows my spiritual nature and the spiritual nature of my appearance and activities and activities one might think oh i know krishna's activities he killed putana he lifted govardhan hill and all these activities so do i upon leaving the body not take another birth in this material world Srila Prabhupada said it's not that simple <laughs> It's not that simple. First of all, we here is he says such liberation of the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy. So theoretically, no. Krishna's how he appears and his activities that is not sufficient. But on the other hand, there are impersonalists and yogis, they also attain liberation. But after much trouble and many, many births, there is a verse in Bhagavad Gita, which we have many times explained, Pahunam Janmanam Mante Gyanabam Mamprapatyate Vasudeva Sarvam Iti Samahatma Sudulapa. After many births and death, he who is in knowledge surrenders unto me. Such a great soul is very rare. So, knowledge. We'll have to come to that knowledge. And as a devotee, it's actually easy. We come to that knowledge that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Full stop. If anybody asking us, who is Krishna? Immediately we shall answer, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada likes that. There was a, a little girl, Saraswati. And uh, she did not know much of philosophy. She was a simple little five-year-old girl. And in school, some girls were asking, who is Krishna? And she immediately answered, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
if you understood it fully or not, that is a different question. And Srila Prabhupada, when he heard that, said she answered, she said, he said, this is, this, this girl is preaching. This is uh, perfection. She, all what she knows is, who is Krishna? Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Three things. He's supreme. Most people in this world think I am supreme. Everybody wants to be supreme. There's competition for being supreme. Everybody dreams of getting a position in this material world where he's supreme. Getting a position of a good worker, one of the better workers, of the favorite workers of the boss. And eventually one thinks, oh, I wish I could be the boss. And even if he is a boss of the company, then he thinks I should be the regional leader. And then I should be a minister in the government. And after that, prime minister. And after that, I want to become God. By impersonal philosophy, by merging into Brahman, I become Brahman. So I am God. Everybody is God, and I am also God. So these aspirations are there. But uh, in that short statement, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And we understand Krishna is supreme. He has always been supreme. He is supreme now, and he will always be supreme. His position we cannot achieve. We can achieve anything in this material world. But Krishna, this position is already taken. So, therefore, he is supreme. Brahma Samhita says, Ishvarama Parama Krishna Satchitananda Vikraha Anadirade Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. Very important. Sarva Karana Karanam. He, Krishna is the cause of all causes. That's not a, a light statement. Everything has a cause in this material world. If we look at our cause, who is our cause? Oh, my parents, my father, my mother. Okay, who is their cause? Oh, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, and so on. It goes back generations. Some people are very... Uh, enthralled of researching their ancestry, how many generations back and back, uh, what family are coming from, and so there's a cause. And the grandparents, the parents, and the cause is the grandparents, and the cause of the grandparents, the great grandparents, and going back, back, back. And even if it was possible to make an empirical research, going, finding out who is the supreme in our family. That's not very difficult. Mostly the man posing as supreme, but actually behind the wife is actually supreme. <laughs> because a man generally dances according to the wishes of the wife. So she's supreme. If we then look further in our community, we'll find someone who is supreme, who is uh, worshipped even as a great uh, community leader. No, he is supreme. If we're looking in the country, we find someone who is supreme. It's not supreme in quality, qualifications in quality. That's a different question. But supreme in social position. If we're looking in the continent, we'll find someone who is supreme. If we look throughout the world, we find a personality who is truly higher than everybody else who is supreme. If we look throughout the universe, 
with all the devas and Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, uh, Indra, all the host of the demigods. So someone is supreme. We come to Lord Brahma, he is supreme. Our entire Sampradaya, the Brahma, Gaudiya, Vaishnava, Sampradaya, Brahma, it started with Lord Brahma, millions and millions of years back. So sometimes people say Krishna consciousness is a new religion. Not at all. It goes millions of years back, our roots, with Lord Brahma, the first uh, being in the universe, born on the lotus flower from the navel of Vishnu. So he's supreme. It's also position. Lord Brahma is not eternal. He has a body out of material energy. His body lasts a little bit longer than our body. Our body lasts maximum for 100 years. Lord Brahma's body lasts for millions and millions of years. As we go higher in the planetary system, there is relativity of time. Some living entities are living a thousand years higher up in the higher planets. And then others go higher and they're living uh, 10,000 years. And further, moving higher up, heavenly planets, 100,000 years. And Lord Brahma, millions of years. That is his life expectancy. Even one day of Lord Brahma is uh, a big number compared to life on earth. That's easy to understand because there are certain insects that are just living one day. One day, that's their life expectancy. So they're smaller. One day. In that one day, everything happens. They're raising their children, they're growing up, and then at the end of the day, they're dying. So everything what we experience in 100 years, a small insect experiences in 24 hours. And everything what we experience in 100 years, demigods experience that same in a, a time span of 10,000, 100,000 years. It's relative, as Albert Einstein has clearly shown theory of relativity. Relative. And when astronauts went up in the Sputnik, in the space capsule, and stayed for some time, when they came back, there was a difference in the time uh, of a few seconds perhaps even a minute. So there, it was a, a time difference. One could measure that. Even at a quite low space orbit in the sky. So, the impersonalists, Srila Brahman makes it and others that take many births to surrender to Krishna. For a devotee, it's very easy. He can surrender to Krishna almost immediately. Of course, the level of surrender, that's another question. Uh, full surrender is not that easily achieved. But one surrenders if one likes to hear topics about Krishna, that's a surrender. It comes easy, one likes to hear. And then there might be a commitment. Okay, let me chant every day, one round. Oh, that is quite some commitment. Not when I feel like, and I don't chant when I don't feel like, but out of duty. 
I chant one round, the mantra 108 times. That's one round. Every day, if my mind is agreeable or not agreeable. That is surrender. And then accordingly, if we chant four, eight, sixteen rounds, as Srila Prabhupada puts a standard for devotees who are fully involved in Krishna consciousness, sixteen rounds, two hours, one and a half hours to two hours of chanting every day, like meditation. The, the yogis they do meditation also, but much more longer. So sitting for hours and hours on end and meditating, going inwardly, meditating on the Paramatma within the heart, the super soul. So that is surrender, but there's much more. Then we surrender our desire for uncontrollable sex life. We surrender our desire for uncontrollable tastes and eating whatever we feel like, we're restricting that. We don't stop it, but we're restricting that to things which can be first offered to Krishna. So immediately, if we offer our food, immediately certain food items are out of the question. We may start off offering some of our food which are offerable, and that offering can be very simple. With a prayer of our own making, or with just chanting that Hare Krishna mantra three times before we start eating, and being conscious that food comes from the Lord, please, Lord, bless that food. And then the food becomes spiritually imbued with Krishna's transcendental energy. That's surrender. And then we give up gambling, and we give up any intoxication. Doesn't come that easy, particular for those coming from an Indian background. So I've been trained from small childhood on to drink tea. Ooh. Why is India drinking tea? Everywhere. Chai, chai, chai on the train. Chai. Tea time, tea time. Go to Vrindavan, you go at a certain time to the post office. It's open. Doors are open, but there's nobody there. They ask, what, what's happening? Oh, chai time, tea time. People don't work when tea time, they're drinking their tea. So where has the tea drinking come from? It's not always been culturally within the Indian psyche. No. The English introduced the tea drinking, and the Indians kicked out the English, but they kept the tea drinking. <laughs> Strange enough. The culture has festered. They like it. So, to give up tea, coffee, alcohol, not that easy for some, some it's a bit easier, others not that easy, because it's a habit. If you are habituated of drinking tea every day, oh, I need my tea, otherwise I cannot function. I cannot work, it gives me energy. Yes, of course, it gives you uh, uh, stimulation, artificial stimulation, and then you depend on it. I have, almost a lifetime ago, in a, a colleague at work, an older man, I was young, he had to, he started shaking. Suddenly, this man started shaking, his hands are shaking, his whole body shaking. He said, I have to go and drink my coffee. It was withdrawal symptoms. He was shaking visibly shaking. Then when he came back and he has drunk his coffee, then he was quiet again for a couple of hours and then he had to drink his coffee again and so addicted. And what to speak of alcohol addiction. Oh, just a little bit alcohol here and there. Some even say that's healthy. 
But then some other scientists say, no, that's a myth, it's not healthy even a little bit. And then people become also habituated to drinking alcohol. So to give up intoxication, that is a surrender. And that may come gradually. And to give up meat eating is also a surrender. Because people in these Western countries, in India also now, say habituated eating meat from small childhood. They think they, have, they get the taste of the blood, of the meat, and they think they cannot do without it. Oh, I must have my meat. So habits, nothing more than habits. Nobody does need to eat meat. You don't die if you don't eat meat. You don't die if you don't have tea and coffee and intoxication and worse things and drugs. You don't die if you have a regulated sex life. You don't die if you don't gamble. It's happened by association of people who are addicted to drinking, let's say, drinking alcohol. If we associate with drunkards, then soon we'll be a drunkard too except we are a devotee of Krishna. And then all the drunkards become also devotees of Krishna. That's, that needs a strong conviction and preaching spirit. So that surrender. It goes deeper and deeper. And then, okay, we follow perfectly well the so four principles and we're chanting our 16 rounds. So then the next surrender is... Uh, now you have learned Krishna consciousness quite well. You know the philosophy. You have heard Bhagavad Gita so many times. Sir. And you are regular reading. You know all the arguments. And now you preach. Now you give this knowledge of enlightenment to others. It's just like if someone is drowning in a lake. We have a duty to rescue that person. It's our sacred duty to rescue that person who is drowning. We cannot just turn our back and, oh, I haven't seen anything. And he's calling for help, help, help. But if he cannot swim, and we're jumping into the water, and we cannot swim, and we're drowning. That is foolishness. First, we have to learn how to swim. Then we can rescue that person who's drowning. So same, first we have to know Krishna consciousness to some extent. And then we can preach. That is the order of Srila Prabhupada and the whole Guru Parampara. Don't be satisfied with your own liberation. Help others to achieve this liberation too. Otherwise it's selfish. I'm, I'm only looking after myself. There are certain Bhajananandis, which are, they have achieved liberation, but they only care about their personal liberation. And there's another group, which are called Goshtyanandis. They care about everybody else, like Prahlad Maharaj. When Lord Nisimhadev wanted to give him a blessing, and said, you, Prahlad, you come home with me, come to the spiritual world. What did Prahlad say? He didn't say, okay, finally, thank you so much. Where is the airplane? Vimana. So, Prahlad replied to Lord Nisimhadev, How can I go back home with you to the spiritual world when I see all these rascals suffering in this material world, birth after birth after birth? Srila Prabhupada was very fond of Prahlad Maharaj. 
<coughs> because Prahlad was a preacher. When he was with us as children, he received the knowledge of Krishna consciousness while within the womb of his mother. Because Narada Muni was reading the Bhagavatam. And Prahlad was in the womb, he could hear it. So, he refused. How can I go back home if all these rascals are suffering in this material world? So that should be our guidelines. First of all, we make sure we can swim and then we helping others. Of course, sometimes the Buddhist brings that argument, oh, I'm, I cannot preach, I'm not knowledgeable enough. I'm not advanced enough. And that is most in most cases, it's an excuse, a cheap excuse. Because even that little girl, Saraswati, all she knew was Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And Srila Prabhupada said, that's a preacher. Just repeat what you have heard. And she just said, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And so whatever we know about Krishna, we can speak to others. But at the same time, of course, we have to advance our knowledge so we can meet all kinds of arguments. The Buddhists have to become experts to meet all kinds of arguments, all kinds of objections. So many things. So the depth of surrender, there seems to be no end to it. It goes on and on. However, here Srila Prabhupada makes that point. The impersonalists, they want to obtain the Yuchya Mukti, liberation by merging into the effulgence, the Brahmachati of the Lord. And then Srila Prabhupada says, this is only partial. And there's a risk of returning to this material world. Now one may ask, why is there a risk of returning to this material world? If I have achieved uh, Sayujya Mukti, liberation, by merging into the effulgence of the Lord. Why would say, that's a very wonderful position. I'm, I'm so close to the Lord at least to his effulgence, not to him personally, but his effulgence, the white, great light. So, it's like we want to merge into the sunshine. But that doesn't give us the opportunity to travel to the sun planet. And by the way, the sun planet is explained. They're living entities in the sun planet. They have just a fiery body. Well, someone may object. Nobody can live in the fire. Well, we have living entities that are living in the water. We have living entities living in the earth. We have living entities living in, in the air. So why not fire? Earth, water, fire, air, which are the four gross material elements that's the Bhagavad Gita verse Bhumi Apo Nalo Vayu Bhumi is earth, Apo Nalo, water Vayu, air earth, water, fire and air so if in the three elements living entities can exist then why not in the fire and we have information from the Shastra that there are living entities living in the fire. They have a fiery body. Living entities, fish, aquatics, they have a watery body. They have a special body they can stay in the water. They don't need to come out. We cannot stay in the water for very long. It's not our element. And then there are birds and other living entities saying, are in the air. 
most of the time in the air. So in the sun planet, the living entity is living there. There is the sun god, the ruler of the sun planet, Vivas One. And there are cities and much more. And everything is shining. Everything is shining in the sun planet. And that's the sunshine. The effulgence of the inhabitants in the sun planet. That's the effulgence. Likewise, if we look at this Brahma Jyoti, this spiritual energy of the Lord, which incidentally comes from that's a bodily rays of the Lord, and in particular the rays which are afflicted in his toenails. So the Brahma Jyoti is actually the, the effulgence reflected in the Lord's toenails. Interesting. So how, what does that Brahma Jyoti exist of? It exists of innumerable living entities. Living entities who wanted to merge into the affluence of the Lord. That is where they are situated as tiny little shiny part, shining particles. Just like the sunshine. The sunshine, if we uh, scientifically analyze, uh, are photons. Little quantum particles, it's not just energy, we cannot see them, they're so small. But they're actually shining particles in the sunshine. So we said Brahma Jyoti, there are shining particles, spirit souls. So that is the Brahma Jyoti. So here Srila Prabhupada says, to achieve that Brahma Jyoti, why is there a risk of returning to this material world? As we have given that example, and Srila Prabhupada gave that example, just imagine, you are sitting in a field, a vast field, grain field, like in the American grain belt. It's so vast, wherever you look, in every direction, there's only a field, a wheat field, so vast it is, up to the horizon in every direction. So Srila Prabhupada explained to a devotee who wanted to retire from active preaching, just a peaceful life, just sitting somewhere and chanting Hare Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada gave that example, just you're sitting in a field for eternity, because we are eternal. Just imagine, you're sitting in a field for eternity, just us alone, just sitting there, nothing to do, no activity, no variety, all, all wheat, wheat field around, nothing else. So then the devotee, when he heard that explanation from Srila Prabhupada, he, he immediately said, oh no, that's not for me. I'd rather go to New York and go uh, on the street and preach and distribute books. And Yes. So that's why generally there is a risk of returning to this material world because we are made in a way that we, we desire variety and activity also. There is a saying, variety is a mother of enjoyment. So if all, if we eat our even favorite food every day, for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner, every day, every week, Every month, every year, we'll be bored of very quickly. We want variety. Okay, today I have veg, veg, veggie with rice. 
tomorrow I have chapati with veggie. After I have kitri. And then I have chapatis with salad. And then I'm back with kitri. And so we want variety. So being in this Brahmachodis, there's no variety. So then, because we are, the soul is eternally active. It's an active principle in the body. The soul is not just stationary, static, active. Like in our life, we are always active. So once we're sitting in that field, once we're in that Brahma Chyoti, there's nothing to do. Just sitting there for eternity. And the desire arises again in the mind of enjoying some varieties and being active. And that desire brings us back to this material world. Even great, and Srila Prabhupada gives that example, even great, great sannyasis, so renouncing the world only to come back to the world and open some hospitals and do some philanthropic work. Because they can just renounce without doing anything. They want activity. So it's returning to the material world, the same material world which they have rejected as false. Of course, the material world is not false. It's real, but it's temporary. Not false, but temporary. Like a cloud in the sky. It's not eternal. Today cloudy, tomorrow sunshine. The cloud will move on. So, because of the soul is active and we hankering for variety, then there is all risk of returning to this material. So that's the impersonalist. They think mukti is the last word in self-realization. But it's not. It's not. After mukti, then real pure devotional service really starts. Pure devotion. There was devotion before, but not pure devotion. Because that devotion before we come to the liberated stage that was tainted with our material desire. It's like spoon feeding a child. One for that little boy, one for daddy, one for you, one for me. And that little boy is so enthused. Uh, he didn't want to eat, but if see daddy is eating, and then the next spoon is for him. I, he gets conquered by the little game and he's eating what he was supposed to eat. Even veggie, which he doesn't like. So parents using that since time immemorial to trick the children to eat healthy spinach, which they don't like. <laughs> so that is one level of Practicing devotional service. I do something for you, and you do something for me. And we do with Krishna like this. One of my desires, my Lord, you fulfill, I will fulfill one of your desires. And then as we grow in devotional service, then we come to, I do two of your desires for exchange with one of my desires. And then we come to the point uh, of 60, 70 percent for Krishna, 30 for me, 80, 20, 90, 10. Then 100% for Krishna, and I don't want anything in return. That is called pure devotional service. Shuddha bhakti, pure bhakti. Now that's a goal. So, we spoke of this 
liberated platform. There's a very nice verse in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Buddha Prasanatmana Shuchati Nakangshati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Lapate Param Brahma Buddha, that's a liberated stage, the Brahma Buddha platform. We have many times spoken about this. Prasanatma, fully joyful on that. Once we achieved that liberation, liberation means, of course, free from the three modes of material nature. Once we, on that platform, then we become prasanatma, fully joyful. And then we don't lament anymore, we don't hanker. Normally, our whole life is lamenting what we have lost and hankering what we think will make us happy. If I had, if I had one million, if I won the lottery, I would be truly happy. I know how I would spend my money and this and that. I give some away to charity as well and all of that, hankering. Therefore, gambling is not is against the principles of devotional service because we're making plans if I win the lottery, then I will do this. So this is not very conducive. We should depend on the mercy of the Lord. There's a nice example of Lord Chaitanya traveling with his servant, and one day, Lord Chaitanya says to his servant, and I think it was Govinda, can you go and find some Haritaki? Haritaki is a, a spice, it's a, a herbal uh, compound, which is good for digestion and so on. So he said, you go find some Haritaki. It was difficult to find. Govinda went around and to the marketplace and asking people, where can I find some Haritaki? Oh no, we don't have any. Uh, we would give you, but maybe you go to that market and, and another market and nobody was Haritaki. Eventually, after many hours, he found some Haritaki. He came back to Lord Chaitanya and was very pleased. Next day, Lord Chaitanya asked again, can you secure some Haritaki? And within five minutes, Govinda was back and here, my Lord, here's some Haritaki. And said, Lord Chaitanya said, well, what happened? Yesterday it took five hours. And today, five minutes. You have kept something aside from yesterday, haven't you? And Govinda said, yes. I thought you will ask for Haritaki again today. So I was prudent. And he thought he was very wise, and very intelligent. So I kept some Haritaki. So you can have Haritaki today also. And Lord Chaitanya was not very happy. He said, you are not depending on the mercy of the Lord. You're making your own provisions. You're stocking and storing like everybody does. In this material world, everybody is uh, keeping stocking up, stopping, stocking up money for the rainy days, stocking up food, stocking up this and that, and hoarding so many things, just in case. But that's the opposite of depending on Krishna, on Krishna's mercy. So he said to Govinda, you have... Uh, adopted the mentality of a householder. Householders do that, and they may have to do that even, to care for the family, so a little bit of bank balance, uh, food stocks, and this and that, just to make sure everybody is always comfortable. So, but a brahmachari, as Govinda was, that was not a good idea. So he said, you, you should get married. You have adopted the mentality of a householder. A brahmacharya sannyasya vanaprashta is depending fully on Krishna's arrangement. Krishna will provide. Perfect example is Srivas Thakur. Srivas Thakur is a very 
elevated personality. He is a member of the Panchatatra, the five associates of Lord Chaitanya. We always chant Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Srivas Adi. Srivas, here he is. That's Srivas Thakur. He was a householder. He had a big family. So one day, Lord Chaitanya took him aside and said, Srivas, you have a big family and wife and children and relatives, but I never see you going out and being busy, busy like everybody else, and money, 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 and food, and this and that. So how come? Because Lord Chaitanya was staying at the house of Srivas Thakur, so he could observe. And then Srivas Thakur clapped in his hands three times. That's all. And so Lord Chaitanya looked at him, puzzled. What does that mean? And he clapped again three times. And again, then Lord Chaitanya said, please explain, what does it mean? You clap three times in your hands. And then Srivas Thakur explained, I'm depending on Krishna. If somehow or other, uh, Krishna doesn't provide for my family for three days, if three days are passing by, and uh, we are all starving and we have no food. I will jump in the Ganges and drown myself. So strong was his faith that Krishna will provide. It's not possible that Krishna will not provide for three days. And Lord Chaitanya was very pleased. He said, what did you just say? She was, what did you say? You are the most elevated devotee, completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord. I tell you one thing, Srivas. Even if Lakshmi Devi, the consort of the Supreme Lord of Narayan, even if Lakshmi Devi falls into Lakshmi Devi, of course, Devi is of course a goddess of fortune. She has also fortune. Everybody is praying. For fortune, money, gold, silver, coins, Lakshmi. They do Lakshmi Pucha, to please Lakshmi, to get a little bit of said Lakshmi, which she controls. The whole world is after Lakshmi Devi, goddess of fortune. I want some fortune too. Please make me fortunate. So Lord Chaitanya said, if somehow or other Lakshmi Devi falls on some hard times, sir. And uh, she runs out of her fortune. I, Benedict Yushivas Taku, you will never go without the Lord's mercy and prosperity. So he blessed him like that. And no, Shivas Taku had no material problems. He didn't make provisions, even so he has been a householder, but somehow or other, people came and said, here, uh, Srivas Thakur, I have bought you a bag of rice. Someone else came, oh, I have some flour for you. I just was in the market and there was a good bargain and uh, like two for the price of one. <laughs> and I picked up one and I thought of you, so here is one bag of flour. And some gore is here, and we brought you some ghee, and so it was always like that. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita also, uh, those who are devoted of serving me with love, I make arrangements. I preserve what they have. I maintain what they have and uh, supply what they lack. Well, that's a big word. Krishna says, if someone is fully devoted to me, I personally make sure what 
whatever you have is preserved and whatever you're lacking is supplied by me personally there's the story of that brahman very learned brahman he was regularly studying bhagavad gita when he came across that verse i preserve what you have and i supply what you lack he thought how how is that possible krishna personally krishna says i krishna personally supplies if i'm missing something and the brahmana and his wife they were very poor very poor so hardly had anything to eat so how is it possible that the lord is personally supplying good stuffs i don't believe that maybe he sent someone he makes some arrangements and someone else will come but personally the lord will supply and he took his pen and he crossed out that verse or that portion of the verse and thinking that must have been a mistranslation because we never take a pen to bhagavad gita Some people have done that who did not know to make some annotation in bhagavad gita as i think it's just an ordinary book no we never write in bhagavad gita it's shastra we want to make some annotation take some sticky notes and put them all over so then that brahmin he went begging for some food as he normally every day he does but that day it was very difficult more difficult than any other day and uh, it was already late and he hadn't collected anything in the meantime his wife was at home and she wondered oh, my husband is not coming back i haven't eaten anything today and then suddenly two young boys beautiful boys appeared beautiful very delicate feature soft young boys and curly hair and so they were carrying uh, some as they're doing in india a stick a bamboo cane with some baskets on each side and the, the baskets were full of vegetables of rice and ghee and milk and butter and everything one could only ask for and she was surprised what, what what is this oh your husband sent us to give you this food stuffs but we have to go oh, oh no wait wait i cook something and you no 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 we have to go because if your husband comes back he will beat us again she said what my husband is such a, a peaceful non-violent man what are you saying he's beating you and then one boy turned around and said look and there were some marks of a whip red marks were on his back she was horrified how could my husband do that such a cruel man delicate young beautiful boys and he beating them and then she went and then a short time later the husband came and the wife has already started cooking and she was so much uh, disappointed of her husband that she started eating normally in indian traditions a wife doesn't eat before her husband interesting even in my family 50 years 60 years back <coughs> that was an unspoken rule we always ate dinner together when my father came back from work and we sitting there nobody dared to start eating no we waited until father has started to eat and then we all ate as children <coughs> that was the rule and my mother she was still supplying let's say pancakes she was cooking pancakes and everybody was eating and only when everybody was satisfied then she sat down the last few pancakes she was eating 
So that's Indian tradition, but has been in the past. Things have changed, of course. That also in the Western countries. So the woman, the wife was eating and the husband was saying, what's going on? You never eat before me and today you're eating before me. And she said, oh, you are so cruel. I said, what do you mean? Yes, and she explains the whole story of the beautiful, young, tender boys. And uh, they showed me even on their shoulders these streaks, these red streaks where you, you hit them. You're such a cruel person. How can you do something like that? And then the Brahman realized that Krishna and Balaram personally have come and supplied the foodstuff. And he wept bitterly for crossing out the words in the Bhagavad Gita. I supply what you lack and I maintain what you have. And he wept even more bitterly that he couldn't get the darshan of Krishna and Balaram. His wife got the darshan, but he didn't. Well, that's just another story. There are many stories. If we depend on Krishna, Krishna will supply. No question. But we don't want to take the chance. <laughs> what if not? What if? <laughs> okay. So, Yishila Prabhupada writes, but the devotee, simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the Lord, attains the abode of the Lord after ending his body and does not return and runs the risk of returning to this material world. So that's in contrast to the impersonalists who merge in the Brahmachoti and they run the risk of returning to this material world. But devotees of the Lord, they don't run that risk. Because they know the Lord and they have a relationship with the Lord and they know his activities, his transcendental activities, his pastimes, and so on. And then Srila Prabhupada states the Brahma Samhita 533. The Lord has many forms and incarnations, Advaitama, Chuttama, Nadi, Ananda, Rupam. Also, there are many transcendental forms of the Lord, there is still one and the same personality of Godhead. Some people cannot grasp that. That the Lord can expand himself into many different incarnations. Ananta, Rupam, Rupam is form. But, uh, because we cannot do that. So we're taking our measurement and putting that on the Lord. So in that Brahma Samhita, Advaita Machya Achyuta Manadima Nandarupam Adhyam Burana Purusham Navayavanam Cha Vede Shudurla Bamadurla Bamatma Bhakto Govindam Madhi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami Lord Brahma the first-born living entity, he is praying, I worship Govinda, the primal, primeval Lord, who is inaccessible to the Vedas, but obtainable by pure, unalloyed devotion of the soul. There are a certain class of men who want to achieve God by studying the Vedas, and also the Mayavadis and impersonalists, they're going down that route. They are studying Vedanta Sutra and inter interpreting Vedanta Sutra in so many ways. But here, Lord Brahma prays, I worship Govinda as a primeval Lord, who is inaccessible to the Vedas. Even the Vedas cannot show Govinda, Krishna. But he can be obtained by pure unalloyed devotion of the soul. That we just explained. That pure devotional service when all impurities, all the modes of nature on that Brahma Buddha platform, that modes have ceased to exist. Why? Sometimes from the yogic point of view we think 
We can achieve perfection by our own endeavor, but we cannot be depending on the mercy of the Lord. And there is this nice example, which is better for the kitten, the cat way or the monkey way? When it has been concluded, the cat way is better. Because a monkey, to get transported by the mother, he has to hold on by his own strength on the fur of the mother. He jumps her and he has to hold on so that he doesn't fall down. So that's a yogic way. But the kitten, he has to, not, has to do nothing. The cat picks up the kitten in her mouth. It's the same mouth which kills a rat. Is so gentle with the kitten and she carries the kitten from one place to another. That's a devotee way. We're depending on the mercy of the Lord. Not by studying the Vedas and trying to achieve Krishna. So then Srila Brahma Samhita, the Lord Brahma prays further. Govinda, the Lord who is without a second, who is no subject to decay, Everything in this material world is decaying. Krishna is never decaying. What's the proof? When Krishna was on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he was uh, over a hundred years old by time calculation. But he was in the same useful body as, as ever and before. We never see a picture of Krishna as an old man. Not like the Christian tradition. They thinking God is the oldest. Yes, he is. Uh, so they depicting him, the artists, as an old man with a beard. He's the oldest. It's true. Krishna is the oldest, but he's also the youngest. Navayavanam. Eternal youth. He's the oldest and the youngest. So we never show Krishna as an old man. He's eternally young. Although he was in Kurukshetra during the battle, he was a hundred years old. So therefore, uh, Lord Brahma is quite right of saying, Govinda, who is not subject to decay? We have decay in our bodies all the time. And that word decay Tooth decay. We have to go to the dentist because there's decay. And the animal is rotting away. And then we have to have a filling. And uh, there's so much decay. And then some bodily parts have to be fixed. And everything is decaying. And eventually uh, the body cannot be fixed any longer. And we have to leave the body. Take on another one. So here Lord Brahma prays, you Krishna, Govinda, you without decay and without beginning, without beginning. Some people have a hard time of understanding. They sometimes ask, okay, God made everything, but who made God? They don't understand. God is eternal. He's without beginning and without end. You cannot ask this question, who made God? That's a very material uh, thinking, because we have a beginning and an end, his body, not we, but the body. So we think Krishna's body is just like that, just because he comes in a human-like form. Not human form, human-like, it appears like human, but it is not. No human child appears uh, as a four-handed Vishnu or lifts Govardhan Hill with a little finger on his left hand, of his left hand, and held that he up for seven days and seven nights, and no human or so many other wonderful activities or showing the universal form to Arjuna. Innumerable transcendental pastimes. So it's without beginning. Sometimes as small children who have little understanding when the sun goes down in the evening, then they think, what's happened to the sun? The sun is dead. The mother said, yes, the son will take birth again tomorrow morning. Go to bed now. So then the children thinking the son dies in the evening and 
takes birth in the morning with a little knowledge and childish mentalities that one could think like that. But if the children are a little bit more intelligent, the parents say the sun goes to sleep. And then in the morning the sun wakes up again. Okay, that makes more sense. But, mommy, the gun, sun goes to sleep over there. And when the sun wakes up, it's just the opposite side. And they're a little bit more inquisitive. So, of course, the sun doesn't die or goes to sleep. He's just disappearing out of our vision. As soon as the sun goes down, the sun is setting, the sun is rising somewhere else. If we travel from east to west, we are always in the sunshine. Always, because we are traveling with the sun. But there is no sunset. Anyone who has been in India and traveling back to the west, it's light. It's always light. I want to sleep. Put the airplane, put the shutters down. I need some rest. <laughs> because we're traveling with the sunlight. So the sun goes down somewhere and rises somewhere else. So Krishna is like that. He is without beginning and he appearing somewhere and disappearing and appearing somewhere else, wherever he wants, he's free to appear and disappear. Also, he follows certain schedules. Once in the day of Brahma, which is a very long day, millions of years. Then Krishna comes as an avatar, as an incarnation. Or he comes personally as in his original transcendental human-like form. Two-handed Krishna, bluish complexion, peacock feather in his hair and a crown on his head and armlets and earrings and a garland. So that is Krishna, once in the day of Brahma. But he can come at any time he chooses. Generally he keeps to the schedule. So therefore Krishna is, Govinda is without a beginning, Lord Brahma prays, whose form is endless. So that is, that is a point of Krishna's form is endless. That's why we came to say Brahma Samhita verse. Krishna's form is endless, unlimited forms. How many incarnations? As many as there are waves in the ocean. As many. Can we count the waves in the ocean? No, we can. Innumerable waves generated. Every moment, some new waves are generated. That's like Krishna's incarnation, innumerable. Srila Prabhupada uh, said, that may come as a surprise, Krishna appears in every species of life, even amongst the vegetables. <laughs> Vegetable incarnation. And then Lord Brahma says, Krishna's, Govinda's forms are endless. And he is the beginning and the eternal Purusha. And yet, he is a person possessing the beauty of bloom, blooming youth. That's interesting. As we have already explained. Blooming youth. Also, he is the oldest of the oldest. So that was Brahma Samhita 533. And Sri Prabhupada confirms that the Lord has many, many forms and incarnations. Advaita Machuta Manati Manantarupam. And we need to know. Also, there are many transcendental forms of Krishna. He's still the same Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, 
and then an interesting statement. One has to understand this fact with conviction. Not only intellectually, it may be true, it may not be true. No, with conviction. Yes, that's how it is. Fully convinced. So therefore some intellectual understanding of Krishna's appearance and disappearance may not be enough. We must have that conviction. Yes, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he appears and disappears and he has so many incarnations of with conviction. Although it is incomprehensible to the mundane scholars and empirical philosophers, they cannot understand all of that. That is something which only devotees can understand. So Krishna eternally engages in many transcendental forms in relationship with his devotees. That is a secret. Why Krishna takes on all these various forms, why he appears, to please his devotees. There is this famous verse in Bhagavad Gita, Yada yada hi dharmasya klani bhavati parata abhyutanam dharmasya tadadmanam shri chamyaham. When the religious principles decline and irreligion takes over the world, then Krishna says, I appear to punish the demoniac and to save my devotees. So one may argue, that's why Krishna appears. But that's actually not why Krishna appears. Because he could easily employ his energy to kill the demons. He doesn't have to appear personally. But the secret is Krishna appears personally to please his devotees who are anxiously awaiting to see him. So whatever Krishna does, it is for the pleasure of his pure devotees. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the devotees, I am in the heart of the devotees. For the devotees, I am everything and all. And they are in my heart. For me, they are everything and all. So there is a very intimate relationship between Krishna and his devotees. It's like having a very, very good friend. He will do anything and everything for us. Big, wonderful friend. So Krishna is like that. So, let's see if there is any question. Vijay. Because we're coming to half past eight now. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, the little girl um, said Krishna was Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, if I was speaking to a scholar or a, somebody who's a Vedic astrologer, would it, if I if I was to say, um, I want to know if this is correct. If I, if I said, um, uh, Ishbaraha, Paramaha, Krishnaha, is that also a good description of Krishna? Absolutely. Krishna, Ishbara, Paramaha, Krishna, Satchitananda Vikra. Krishna is uh, Sarva Karana Karanam. He's the cost of everything. He's the Ishvara, he's a controller. Parama, Krishna, yeah. the highest, the supreme controller. Yes, that, that's a wonderful statement of just repeating what Lord Brahma has prayed. These are the prayers of Lord Brahma. Yeah, I, I read it somewhere. It was Ishwaraha, Paramaha, Krishnaha. Yes. Well, it's short and it's pretty, um, it pretty much is a, um, it describes it in just three words. <laughs> yes, it describes it. <laughs> Ishvara, 
Is a supreme controller? Supreme? Paramaha? Supreme? Param? Like Paramatma? Supreme Atma? Yeah. yeah. Parama Krishna. Krishna is a supreme yeah. controller. More than that, Sat Chit Ananda Vikraha. He has a form of Sat Chit Ananda, Sat of eternity, Chit knowledge and Ananda bliss. So his form is made out of eternity, knowledge and bliss. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Krishna's form, Krishna's body is made out of eternity, knowledge and bliss. Our form in comparison is made out of ignorance. Eternity, yes, material body, not eternity, no. Uh, knowledge, not. Ignorance, and bliss, no, we are always lamenting and hankering. That's not bliss. So that is, is a beautiful statement of Brahma Samhita. Anything else, Richard? Uh, just... Uh, one other thing, um, you mentioned the demigods. Um, when they manage the material world, um, their powers are delegated to them by Krishna. So it's just, is it Krishna who gives them the powers? Of it, yeah, so, so if somebody, if somebody worships um, Puja to Lakshmi, um, um, it's it's the power given to Lakshmi. Um, so um who decides whether or not to give it um did, does Lakshmi have discretion to give or, or is it decision not to krishna because he delegates the power so, so, like for the prime minister if the prime minister hears one of his ministers um doesn't follow his directive or does something uh, against his um, policy then um, he's called to a meeting he might he may get sacked <laughs> you know for, uh, yes yes yes, yes. They have done, uh, like Lord Brahma, he has given benedictions to Hiranyakashipu. You will not die outside of the house, not inside, not at day, not at night, not by any animals, by any human, uh, not by any weapons, uh, and so on. And Lord Brahma has given them the benediction, and then the demon thought, I'm immortal because I have tricked out Lord Brahma who I originally asked to make me immortal, and he said he couldn't do it because he's not immortal himself. So I tricked my way around immortality. And then Lord Nisinga Dev appeared and fulfilled all the uh, benedictions of Lord Brahma. He didn't uh, kill him in the house or out of the house, but on the doorstep. Not at night, nor in day, but at dusk. Not with any weapons, but with his fingernails and so on. And, but then, Krishna can do that. He can fulfill all these benedictions. But then he said to Lord Brahma, he rebuked him, don't give such benediction anymore. Mm. So Lord Brahma had overstepped this. He shouldn't have given this benediction because that demon became very, very powerful. He terrorized everyone in the universe. He occupied the throne of Lord Indra in the heavenly planet. So he was a most powerful demon when everybody suffered. So Lord Krishna, Lord Nisimadev, he said, don't do like that anymore. Don't give this kind of benediction. So, yes, the demigods, they can overstep their remit. Then they will be chastised by the Lord. So if, if I wanted, um, if I had something, I wanted I can have Prabhupada because Prabhupada is very close to Krishna. Um so yes. if, in, instead of asking any demigods, you, you ask well the guru um I ask Prabhupada and because he's so close to Krishna, yes. um it, it's you know I feel more comfortable praying to Prabhupada than any other okay. demigod. And that's the why I like to kind of um approach yes. Krishna yes, yes. Prabhupada. Yeah. yeah. Of course, we can do that. Yeah. And uh, the demigods have limited power. The power is deputed by the Lord to the demigods. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, those who worship the demigods, uh, they're actually indirectly worshipping me. But they do so in a wrong way. Mm. So indirectly, uh, say, 
worshipping Krishna, who is behind the demigods, but they do it in a wrong way. They should better approach Krishna directly. Mm. So that's the position of the demigods. Generally, people want material benedictions from the demigods. That's all. Generally, people want nothing more than material benedictions, even from the sadhus they come for fulfillment of the material desires. Let's not forget, we should not uh, discount those people who come to Krishna for fulfillment of the material desires. We have recently read a beautiful verse in a purport where Srila Prabhupada says, those who come for fulfillment of the material desires, who come to Krishna, the magnanimous souls, not ordinary souls, because generally people don't come to Krishna for the fulfillment of the material desires. They do it independently or trying to do it independently. Why should I go to Krishna when I just can work very hard and fulfill my material desires? There's an interesting story when in communist Russia, uh, when the people went to church, and generally the people, Christian people, they're praying, give us our daily bread, they're praying for daily bread. And the communist party members, they came with a truck full of bread. When the people came out of the church, they asked the people, so has God given you your daily bread? And they said, no. And then they said, here, we're giving you daily bread, so we are higher than you, God. Worship us. <laughs> so, yes. But Srila Prabhupada says, and Krishna says, these people are who are coming to him for fulfillment of some material desires, they... They are magnanimous souls. And Srila Prabhupada in the purport, which actually surprised me, he said they're actually Mahatmas, great souls. Generally, the term Mahatma is reserved for very highly advanced uh, devotees who surrender to Krishna. Sa Mahatma Sudurlapa, uh, who after many births and deaths has surrendered to Krishna. These are real Mahatmas, and such uh, Mahatma means Maha. Atma. Maha is big and Atma is a soul. Great souls. So these have usually identified as Mahatmas. But Srila Prabhupada says those who come to Krishna for fulfillment of the material desires are magnanimous souls and they are actually Mahatmas. I thought, wow, that's a very merciful statement of Srila Prabhupada. Because they come to Krishna for it. And they will get, and in that purpose, first as Srila Prabhupada explains, once the material desires are fulfilled, they are, they are peaceful, they are satisfied, and their faith will grow. Like someone asked also for some fulfillment of material desires, and uh, I said, are you praying? Normally, I don't encourage, or I have never really encouraged people to pray to Krishna for their material desires. But after that reading, that purport, I thought, why not? If people are on that level, they cannot think of anything higher than approaching Krishna fulfillment for fulfillment of the material desires, why not encourage them in that? Because Srila Prabhupada said, the magnanimous souls, the mahatmas. So I encourage that person, yes. Pray to Krishna. And then some weeks later, has Krishna fulfilled your desires? She said, yes, yes. And then I said, you see, because you prayed to Krishna. And her faith has immediately increased. And the time will come when we don't approach Krishna for material desires, we approach Krishna for just out of love with no return. That's pure devotion service. Okay, I think here we stop here. Vijay, it's a little bit past our time. I hope that was helpful.
Yes, it's very, yeah, very helpful. Thank you. There's so many points. We haven't even covered the whole purpose, but we never can. We just, uh, whatever. Krishna is inspiring. <laughs> the words just coming on my lips somehow. And uh, so we'll see you not on Saturday because I will be away exceptionally. I will be away. And so we don't have a program this Saturday. But the Saturday after, we are back on as normal. Okay. I will send out a text to everyone explaining that as well to Amit. Are you going back to Germany? Is it? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, well, I think you mentioned it, um, your mother, is it? Yes, yeah. okay. 100, 100. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> so, yes, I will be there. And then okay. I will be back. And yes. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Vijay, for being here tonight. See you Saturday in two weeks. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.